Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. My name is Deacon Jonathan Stewart, and this is the web show about Gnosticism, Bob Dylan, mysticism, Jewish mysticism, whatever I'm fascinated in this week, apparently, because it's going to be like our third show in a row that has a Jewish mystical connection. But of course, uh, Bob Dylan it has been a lifelong obsession for me. I'm really happy to do this show because it's one that both my parents and my in-laws will watch. It's the Gnosis of Bob Dylan we have. <laughs> <laughs> Rabbi Aubrey Glazer as our guest, who's written a whole book on the topic. Hello, Rabbi. Greetings, Deacon John. Good to see you. Uh, it's fantastic to see you. Now, before we dive into this uh, this fascinating, amazing, wonderful topic that is going to, I think, instantly give watchers and viewers enlightenment, you know, the sort of Satori experience. They're going to watch the show. They're going to instantly reach whatever enlightenment is just from these 45 minutes. I first have to do uh, a little bit of a commercial for our Patreon, patreon.com slash Gnostic. We can't do the show with out your financial support you can go there donate for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month you do get some perks like early access to the show uh you get to go onto our discord we give you some early access to some of the streaming stuff that we're doing and some of the uh kind of more experimental things that we're trying to get out there as we're trying to introduce more programming you can also go to paypal.com slash gnostic you can do one-time donations there and if you can't help us out financially we understand these are challenging times uh you can these are Gnostic times. Uh, you can also help us out by telling people about the show, sharing it on social media. You're watching this because you're a Bob Dylan fan. You know other Bob Dylan fans. Everybody's a Bob Dylan fan, or they should be. Take the show, send it to them. Uh, they will thank you for it. Okay, Rabbi Glazer, <laughs> here we go. What inspired you to write your book, God Knows Everything is Broken? The great Gnostic Americana songbook of Bob Dylan. And when did you kind of start connecting Dylan and Gnostic ideas? It's a great question. For me, I've struggled a lot with the way that I can justify my love for Dylan. And it seems like for so many of us, we have this existence that we live as deep and devoted Bobcats and Dylan heads. And then we come back to the realm of religion. But the truth is, is that there is this remarkably delicious playfulness that Robert Zimmerman, a.k.a. Reb Shabtai Zissel ben Avraham, known by his Hebrew handle, uh, that Dylan has always played with. He's always been fascinated by the blurring of boundaries and the, um, the ethos, I think, that really drives him in many ways is a riff on one of the Gospels um, that everyone will recall, neither Jew nor Greek, and I translate that into neither joker nor thief, mm -hmm. neither Jew nor Christian. I think that one of the things that for me has been most interesting about Dylan, and especially about writing this book, is to place him in a, a situatedness that is neither Jewish nor Christian, that is neither Jew nor Greek, that is neither joker nor thief, because his lyrical um, landscape that he paints is one that is always so slippery and so inviting. And I argue throughout the book that really in many ways, this is what makes him a Gnostic. And my understanding of Gnosticism as, um, as a, a spiritual searching paradigm really is one where, uh, specifically as it relates to the arts, is that the artist is the one who uh, dives into the realms of deepest darkness to find um, shards of light and to redeem them and to bring them back uh, into the world through art. So that may differ from the ways that some of your um, listeners understand Gnosticism as well as some academics of uh, Gnosticism and religion may see it, but I'm very loose in terms of my understanding of Gnosticism. But for me, each, in each and every age, there are those artists who have the capacity to be able to see through the darkness and to illumine us, even in Dylan's case, which I have argued in the book as well, um, in a very, through a looking glass darkly, what the Zohar, the Jew, Jewish book of mysticism, calls Ba'as Becloria de lo Nahira. He is seeing everything through a looking glass darkly. And in contrast to the other great North American bard uh, who we are both situated very close to, Leonard Cohen, who does find uh, light because there is a crack in everything and that's where the light gets through. For Dylan, especially now, and I'll sh share with you some of the insights later on if we have time, I think especially now with rough and rowdy ways, it's quite clear that there is nothing but darkness. And the only way out of that darkness 
is through song and through dance. You need a song and dance man like Dylan to get you out of it, to get you through it, to be able to cross the Rubicon. But there is actually nothing but darkness. Yeah. Uh, if I was a record reviewer, uh, that would also be, <laughs> be my review of that album. I, I completely agree with you. And and I think regular listeners and watchers, of course, you know, you get put four Gnostics in a room, get seven opinions, right? Uh, the, your interpretation of, of Gnosticism is definitely mine personal. And I think people who watch the show, engage the show, like the show, this is a recurring theme, particularly the, this artistic act of creation of the going into the the darkness to elevate those sparks to save the sparks to bring forth the sparks uh uh the, the act of creation itself uh these are all this is gnosticism for me <laughs> and uh i'm sure my co-religionists many of them would disagree and, and i know uh many scholars out there will disagree but of course scholars disagree that there is such a thing as gnosticism uh but uh, i think you i and our, our audience are, are quite simpatico here so can you tell us uh, about Dylan's religious backgrounds, and I, I put a I put that as a plural. Yes, backgrounds is really important. So what I explore in the book, which I think is really important as a case study of problematizing this whole issue of pigeonholing Dylan into some kind of specific identity, whether it's the born again Christian phase, which uh, I think is a misnomer and uh, has recently been challenged by Dylanologists as well as the Balchuva return to uh, orthodox um, praxis within Judaism. It took place around the same period um, for Dylan. Sometimes uh, they people refer to it as, as kind of like uh, the, the so-called rundown era of, song, uh, of songwriting that ranges from 77 and culminates in 82. So you see him moving through street legal and then going into what I would call the gospel era uh, that really breaks through with remarkable uh, luminal darkness in Slow Train Coming, as well as um, before that with um, uh, Shot of Love, Slow Train Coming, and Saved, and then culminating with, um, with Infidels. And within that trajectory, what we begin to see is that there are nuances to Dylan's engagement with religions, plural. And let me take a step back and take a step forward at the same time, because the question you're asking is deep. So let me unpack it in a, in a few ways. When I, when I speak about luminal darkness relating to Gnosticism, um, in, in many ways, it's not just contained to these four and a half years in Dylan's oeuvre, um, which, in which we really see a continual evolution that remains focused on these textures and nuances of darkness. Really, actually, we could say that culminates with his latest stream, that, um, that recently came out called Shadow Kingdom. His concern with darkness that is not perfect, not blessed, not divine, really remains for the Hibbing Bard, one of his abiding loves and concerns. And this is what I mean when I speak about him as an Americana Gnostic, and that songbook as being um, one that reflects the Americana Gnostic um, ethos. And in many ways, part of what he is challenging us with, and I go into quite into quite some depth with this in analyzing his song called Father of Night from New Morning. Again, full of that paradox of, of darkness uh, in, 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 in combat with the light. Dylan is really challenging whether the Gnostic self within the self is a knowledge that ultimately leads us towards the light and specifically towards any kind of freedom. And part of what I argue in the book, and I'm going to answer your question about religions in a moment, I just want to unpack the Gnostic layer a bit more. Um, but part of what I argue in the book is that Dylan's songbook itself is in this perpetual search for the uncreated self as, in many ways, as the light of the divine seed, as the pearl, but is also obsessed with looking at the human being that is created uh, as a shadow. And he is also looking for those sparks that are elusive, like every grain of sand, the spark of knowing to be sung by the singer, in many ways, I would say, is the self-same substance as the divine itself. And it's the perception of this spark and our inability to grasp it and, and our inability to hold on to that spark, paradoxically for Dylan, I think, is, a, is an act uh, of liberation. Um, and, and that's the way for him that, that original sin is able to fall for the wayside. And so ultimately, for this Americana Gnostic bard, as I call him, he no longer measures his falling as a contingency or even 
uh, a flawed word made flesh, but rather his songbook itself is a hearth of sparks of luminal darkness that help us get through all the lies and all the darkness of this badly broken world. That's what he recently calls it in uh, Crossing the Rubicon, that he has spent, how can I redeem this time so badly spent in this badly broken world? So that's kind of like the Gnostic landscape. And uh, again, in chapter 10, Father of Night, Nothing But Darkness to Love, I go into it in, in quite a lot of extensive detail. And I make comparisons with some classic Gnostic um, gospel texts. But now going to your next question to the religions, um, there was a period, and I deal with this in the book as well, where Dylan was in many ways um, kind of fluttering like the wings of Ezekiel's angels, as they say, Ratzo Bishov. He was to and fro, back and forth. So on the one hand, he was deeply immersed in studying with uh, an evangelical uh, Bible boot camp known as the Vineyard Fellowship that a lot of musicians that uh, were influenced by his backup singers, that one of which he fell in love with, um, an African-American woman whose name escapes me now, as well as T-Bone Burnett, they were enrolled in the Vineyard Fellowship and he was deeply immersed in the study of the prophets, especially Isaiah, which was an abiding obsession of Dylan's and interestingly enough, also of Leonard Cohen's for another discussion together. Um, so he's doing this really crazy, apocalyptical, evangelical, and I don't mean it crazy in the sense that there's something crazy about studying those texts. They're, they're beautiful texts, but he was going into an extreme environment where they were reading these texts as a mapping for the apocalypse, yeah. okay? And then on the other side, he was um, flirting with Chabad Lubavitch and specifically with the Lubavitcher Rebbe. We have evidence that he went to at least two uh, Fabrengans with the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Those are kind of mystical table talks where um, the disciples come uh, around the, um, the, the, the Lubavitcher Rebbe to receive blessing and also just to be kind of receiving sparks that he redeems in uh, in song as well uh, as in teaching. So I share those as two extremes because they're, they're extreme polarities both in, in, in the Jewish Baal Tshuva movement in terms of sort of converting people to be born again, even if they're born as Jews, to become reborn as Baal Tshuva, um, masters of return, these, these, these Jews that return to orthodoxy, or on the other side, um, folks who return to a certain brand of apocalyptic Christianity. And he was going through both of those at a very extreme pace because that was that's the nature of Dylan is that he he dives deep into everything that he's interested in. He absorbs it, he transforms it, he makes it his own. And then, like the Joker, he takes the mask off that he has just donned so expertly and he discards it. So that culminates, as I was saying, with uh, infidels. You can't understand the gospel period unless you also then listen to it in relationship in, in many ways in dialectical tension with infidels which is a complete critique a kind of negative dialectical critique of everything that he did in the gospel years and he's constantly doing that so you can never really pin him down and that's why your question was so great and generative I saw, i'm sorry for going on for so long but oh, please. it's a great question because it really is about bob dylan's religions plural and the masks that he dons and the masks that he discards and whether after through that process, we're left with anything at all, um, or is there nothing sacred um, anymore that uh, that really exists after all of these masks have been discarded? It's a really, it's a fascinating question. And that's that's part of, so going back to your first question, that's why I've been drawn to Dylan, because people quote him religiously. In the book, I decided not only to do an index of scriptures, both in terms of Hebrew Bible, um, the uh, the Synoptic Gospels as well as the Gnostic Gospels. So hats off to uh, to you and to all the viewers here at Talk Gnosis because I want them to be able to find a uh, lead to all those scriptures. That was uh, the academic inside of me that did that, of course. But then I wanted to make this user friendly to Bobcats and Dylan Heads, and I did an index of all of the songs and lyrics, which people who love Dylan quote like scripture. So what I'm suggesting is his songbook is a kind of scripture. A Gnostic Americana scripture. Yeah. Now, a lot of artists, uh, they're inspired by Gnosticism, e even if they're not uh, religious or even interested in religion, because honestly, the mythology, it's, it's neat. 
right? <laughs> so it, it, it grabs the imagination. So sometimes people work it into their works, even if they're not particularly interested in, in Gnostics or Gnosticism. Does Dylan engage with, with specific Gnostic thought with the, the Nag Hammadi uh, scriptures or, or other similar works? Or is he kind of recreating it through his, his, his own uh, the artistic uh, the impulses? It's a, it's a really thoughtful experiment to, to consider, and I try to do that through some of uh, this chapter specifically that deals with Father of Night. And I would just put the question back to you and to say, if I was to, to share this text with you and told you that it came, you know, if we were uh, 150 years or 1,000 years in the future, and you found this text beside a Nag Hammadi text, would you be able to tell the difference when you read Father of Night, Father of Day, Father who taketh the darkness away, Father who teacheth the bird to fly, builder of rainbows up in the sky, father of loneliness and pain, father in love and father of rain, father of day, father of night, father of black, father of white, father who built up the mountain so high, who shapeth the cloud up in the sky, father of time, father of dreams, father who turneth the river and the streams. I mean, if we found that a thousand years from now beside a Nag Hammadi text, I think we'd be hard pressed to be able to tell the difference. And yet, if you were to ask Dylan, is he reading or interested in the Gnostic Gospels? It would be kind of like engaging in that exercise that happens in the IBM commercial when Watson says to him, you know, Mr. Dylan, I've noticed that many of your songs have Gnostic themes in them and they are very interested in love and time lost and darkness. Is this the way that you are able to create uh, of your 600 songs in the catalog that were recently sold such a compelling uh, form of songwriting? And his response would be, yeah, that sounds about right. And, you know, you go through that whole commercial and Dylan will never tell you the answer. And no. all great artists lie, right, yeah. as, uh, as we know. So in the end of the day, I, I think the while it's an interesting and important academic uh, and thought experiment for, for us, I think, as those who are drawn to the arts or to the Gnostic arts, we can call them, if it moves you in a way that begins to, um, to shift and to arouse those sleeping sparks from their slumber and allows them to begin to rise up from the darkness then as far as i'm concerned that's what makes it a uh, gnostic art you know as soon as the spark as soon as a, a man is born the sparks begin to fly dylan writes in another area which again is a as a riff off of the book of job so he's so immersed in scripture uh and scriptures that it would not at all surprise me that you know the uh, the bibles that he's carrying along with him you know, as a song and dance man, include all three. That is to say, Hebrew, Bible, New Testament, and Gnostic Gospels. Yeah. Yeah, and um, uh, for, for your point about the uh, the lyrics, uh, um, I, I don't even know if we have to wait a thousand years. I'm pretty sure I could slip to, to some people now and just be like, hey, here's, have you read this Gnostic text? I'll, I'll try this experiment and get back to you. Yeah, if do, anybody do, the, do the Gnostic taste test and you'll see. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> also, you know, that's a really good point that I, I, I even as as a big Bob Dylan fan, I didn't even think about when I was asking you, because, of course, if anybody ever asked him, he's not going to tell you. Right. He has for those who don't who, who may be fans or, or semi fans or like Bob Dylan, but have not read or watched any interviews with him. Uh, he is um, uh, he's a trickster. He's a liar. He's uh, uh, he, he has he seems to be having fun in some of these interviews. Absolutely. Uh, but he is not revealing. I mean, he is revealing himself and on some level something is being revealed but it, it is also being veiled at the same time <laughs> so. exactly exactly and, and i think that there's an element to that that has its own gnostic artistry that is to say that the truth is always a lie right the truth is nothing yeah. but one big lie but for him you have to conceal um the truth within a veil and and only the ones who are the true knowers will be able to see through the veil towards the truth. I mean, that's really a classic uh, mystical stance that the, the Gnostics also adopt. And I don't think he's at all playing things differently than that. So that puts him very much in that uh, in that department. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I kind of made a list here, which is just uh, what is Gnostic about his? So so we'll run through a, a few, uh, if that's okay. So the first mm -hmm. is, well, what's Gnostic about Bob Dylan's cynicism? I, I feel like we live in a pretty cynical age, but was, so what, what's specifically Gnostic about his cynicism? Well, as I said earlier, his cynicism is, is deeply dark. I mean, it, it becomes uh, articulated for me in the, in the clearest way 
once you reach uh, Not Dark Yet from, I believe that was from Time Out of Mind. And if you, you, you look at the way that he sets the stage there, and then as things with each album get darker and darker, it's not dark yet, but it's getting there. By the time you reach Rough and Rowdy Ways, his cynicism is so profoundly deep that um, he's able to sit within the darkness now and there's no longer this kind of cosmogonic struggle between the forces of darkness and light that we saw earlier on in his career that oftentimes people would say, oh, this is the influence of French symbolist poetry and he's a surrealist. And yes, those are all influences. He was reading Rimbaud and, and Baudelaire and Verlaine. We know that, but um, those are actually strong influences. But he was really engaged in this kind of cosmic battle between the forces of darkness and light. And as he goes further and further on, um, things are not just dark yet, and they're not just getting there, but they really have gotten there by the time you reach Rough and Rowdy Ways. And you see that in Crossing the Rubicon, you, you feel that in Murder Most Foul, and especially um, in, uh, in False Prophet, which we can talk about later, because there's something unique about that, specifically that the last album that was coming out and being released um, after my, my book had already been released. And I'll tell you an interesting story about that afterwards. Please, please. And uh, Dylan is famous or maybe even infamous for his, his constant, not just creation of himself, which of course every artist has to do, particularly mm -hmm. an artist that becomes famous, but his constant reinvention and recreations of himself. How is this a Gnostic impulse? Well, that was something that I was mentioning earlier, right, is mm -hmm. that there, there is this Gnostic sense of the self within the self, which is a knowledge that ultimately leads to freedom. And so Dylan is digging deeper and deeper into the created self or the mask that he's wearing only to discard it and then to put on the next mask. And I, I think that the fact that he is so comfortable with donning these different masks of self and discarding them means that um, either there's nothing, in, in a sense, the emperor wears no clothes and once you remove the veil, there truly is nothing or that's the place where the deepest darkness resides. Uh, that perhaps is a darkness that's so deep that has no face that's that's ultimately discernible. But he really is at home in that place. And this, in many ways, is a deconstruction of selfhood. And if we think about what happens in, the, in some of the Gnostic myths, when you talk mm -hmm. about liberating the sparks from imprisonment so that those sparks of primordial light can return to their source from the darkness because they've been imprisoned, it's not entirely clear but my general sense of the gist of most of these, the thrust of most of these Gnostic myths is that those primordial sparks are redeemed and reunited with their source. And any sense of selfhood that contained or imprisoned those sparks is lost in the process of reunion. It becomes part of a world soul that is um, that it's returning to. So in that sense as well, I think he's also very much in line with liberating ourself from our obsessions with selfhood which really is very much part and parcel of the American dream, right? The, the yeah. sense of the pioneering self and, um, and our obsession around um, the, what, what some scholars have called the sovereign self. Dylan is constantly critiquing that and breaking that down. And again, in contrast to uh, Leonard Cohen, who is always on my mind, um, who did 365 self-portraits, Etch-a-Sketch portraits when he was in Park Portugal that I found in the archive, he was asking himself the question, the Zen Quan, uh, what was your original face? By doing that, he was peeling away the layers of his own selfhood as well. Different context, different discussion for us at another time. But Dylan's doing that in his own way as well, I think. With every lyric, with every album, it's clear that no matter how, how cringeworthy some of those album covers are, you look at them and you realize that he's just continually recreating himself as a song and dance man. I mean, if you think when the circus is pulling up and the song and dance man comes back out, if you're gonna you know, throw your quarter into the box to go and see the song and dance man, you're gonna have to see something new, even if it's still standards, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, what about his understanding of messiahship? Complicated, very complicated. Um, I think that really, his most sophisticated understanding. The gospel years for him um, are crucible. And so he just, he burns through pretty much all of the messianic uh, scripture that he can, especially the typological relationship between the New Testament and, 
and uh, and Hebrew scriptures. I think he spent a lot of time immersed in that, and that comes through in a very, very powerful way uh, through um, through the gospel years. But it's already present very early on. But the way that it's what's so interesting is the way that he reads the figure of the Christ for him really is reading the Christ as, as an outlaw. So you know you could see that uh, as an obsession with him very early on, whether it's you know in terms of um, you know the the way that it's it's cast with uh, within the African American outlaws that he champions, um, the Western uh, outlaws that he champions, or whether it's Lenny Bruce or or, or some other you know contemporary or, or modern Jewish outlaw. He's he's always interested within the the context of that story uh, of, of crucifixion, really uh, of the suffering that leads to you know the suffering servant in Isaiah is the one who really in many ways is able to articulate the most, the sweetest song. And I think that what Dylan um, is interested in throughout all of his, um, his wanderings, his peripatetic wanderings really is how the sweet song emerges from the depth of suffering. And that for me is, is really, it's much more about the process of suffering. So it's more about the process, Messiah as process rather than person. It's irrelevant for, I don't think for him, on any real level, that that the the Christ figure is for him Jesus. I think it's really a, the for him the Christ is about uh, is a process of suffering that leads to great art, and in that sense, you know, he's very much like we could think of like someone like Chagall, who also uses the iconography of the Christ as as really as a metaphor for the um, the suffering artist who is able to sing, and for for Dylan, that's where the sweet songs come through the sweetest of of uh, of his inspiration comes through the depth of his suffering yeah well that leads quite well into the the, the next qu question uh, what about his lyrical ideas about personal brokenness and a broken world so that in many ways i think really is a is a unique interpretation of of Gnosticism that makes it very much an americana Gnosticism because it's very much on the one hand we said earlier it's a critique of the obsession with uh, self -less, self uh, selfishness in the terms of how much American North American culture is, is obsessed with the self, and yet he's showing us that that obsession is completely and utterly uh, broken, and yet it's also the source of so much of the suffering. Right when he, um, for example, in in False Prophet, I'll tell you that story. That I wanted to tell you in uh, in a moment, but just in terms of looking at this question of brokenness, he says, for example, I've searched the world over for the Holy Grail. I sing songs of love. I sing songs of betrayal. Don't care what I think. Don't care what I eat. I climb the mountain of swords with my bare feet. I mean, here there's and throughout the rest of this song and the album, it's very clear that um, he's. Uh, he, he's he's extremely broken because in looking for the world over for the holy grail he hasn't found it and in the process all he can do is sing songs of love and sing songs of betrayal right and the and the refrain in in false prophet is the one that to me is the is really really quite interesting and it also relates to messianism as well going back to your earlier question but uh it's a, a one of the the points in the song he says you know darling that kind of life that i live when your smile meets my smile, uh, something's got to give. I ain't no false prophet. No, I'm nobody's bride. Can't remember when I was born, and I forgot when I died. So this sense of the uh, the spark within him, the primordial spark within him, is something that's eternal. He has no beginning. He has no end. As Christ says, I am the Alpha and I am the Omega. That's really what he's saying. As the Gnostic artist, he is able to um, to connect to that and ultimately to uh to channel it and i want to just point to one more one more thing here that really for me is the nail on the head with um with this sense of uh of, of gnosticism in false prophet he says i'm the enemy of the unlived meaningless life i ain't no false prophet i just know what i know i go where only the lonely can go so this is really interesting in terms of your question right so on the one hand he's a provocateur he is a joker he is the ph philosopher par excellence because he's challenging you uh, in the same way that Socrates did to know thyself, right? But we're not anymore in a place where we can go to the Oracle of Delphi 
and see the words that say know thyself. He's just saying that I'm going to challenge you if you're living an unlived, lived, meaningless life, but don't call me a false prophet. I just know what I know, and I only go where the lonely can go. So where only the lonely can go means that he's in a place of radical solitude, and he's still lamenting um, the lonely self. The, that's the place where he resides. But he also says, I know what I know. And that, for me, is the antithesis of what it means to be a false prophet, right? When he says, I ain't no false prophet, what, is it, what does that mean? Does that mean that he's a true prophet? No. Right. He's actually saying, I know what I know, ergo gnosis yes right yeah. and and the and the thing that I, and i'll just close with this what i wanted to say is is that um i'm very grateful to to bob dylan as well as to um to jeff rosen and david beals who were the ones who were gracious and giving me the permission to quote extensively from dylan's songbook and i sent them the entire manuscript dylan reviewed it um and gave wow. me permission to use all the verses that i used and, and, uh, and i'm really grateful for that but, but in terms of the timing, I just want to make an interesting provocative suggestion, which is that False Prophet came out after my book was already published. And in the introduction to the book, um, I go to great extents to question whether or not he's a false prophet or a Gnostic. And part of what comes out in this song, I would humbly, humbly suggest, um, could perhaps be a response to those who accuse him of being a false prophet, but don't give him any other mantle to wear. And I suggest that it should be the Gnostic uh, mantle. Yeah, yeah, amazing. I, I had no, I had no idea that he had actually read your book. That's that's mind blowing, and to think that you have that connection. There's your your foot into eternity. Um, you now you've already kind of answered this question, but if you could tie it all together, if you could talk about what is Gnostic about his connections between brokenness, creativity, and possibly salvation. Brokenness is the doorway if there ever was a door, as he says in, uh, in Forgetful Heart, brokenness is the door, if there ever was a door, towards creativity. That is to say that the great Gnostic myth, which the, uh, the Jewish Gnostics of Kabbalah called Shvirat Kelim, the breaking of the vessels, um, is only possible um, for the, the ultimate creative being. To be able to create something means there has to be a creative cataclysm. So the Jewish myth of uh, the Jewish Gnostic myth of creation is one uh, that is cata cataclysmic in terms of the the breaking of the vessels themselves. The vessels here in Dylan's case, I would say, really are uh, the standards uh, of the Americana songbook. He knows just not not only rhythm and blues, but in the Tin Pan Alley, Sun Records, everything that was kind of birthed um, on the scarred landscape. The Americana landscape. He knows that that the oeuvre backwards and forwards, and I think a lot of what he was doing, especially when he got to the strange stage where he did triplicate, when people were scratching their head, like, what is he doing singing Sinatra? Like, it's just so bizarre because he's breaking every possible vessel, he's smashing every sacred cow possible, and we could argue about whether or not you know Sinatra sounds better or he sounds better. That's not the point. The point is, is that he's engaged in an act of creative cataclysm, and he's actually knowingly breaking those vessels in order to be able to show us uh, the darkness that resides all around them and within them, and to see if there's a primordial trace of some kind uh, of luminal darkness I keep referring to, not light. And that's the place where, if salvation was possible for Dylan, which I don't think it is, sorry to say, spoiler alert, we're getting near the end of our time here, I don't think he has a recipe for salvation as opposed to Leonard Cohen, who does. Yeah. Um, Dylan is basically saying to us, now that we're at this stage where we've crossed the Rubicon, we will see that um, there is no salvation. And the question then becomes, what do we do with the time that remains? Is there a way to live the meaningful life and not to have to confront the uh, unlived, meaningless life? And that really, for him, is the only thing that I think parallels the meaning making of salvation. But I don't see yet, even in crossing the Rubicon, which is the closest, I think, and in a lot of rough and rowdy ways, there are other uh, suggestions of not necessarily salvation, um, but uh, of a, a trip into another um, form of life or another landscape, kind of like crossing the River Styx or crossing the Rubicon. I think he says that we're we're getting close, 
Um, but it's three miles north of Purgatory, one step from the great beyond. I prayed to the cross, I kissed the girls, and I crossed the Rubicon. So maybe now he's getting to the point in his 80th year where he's saying it's possible, but this is what I was referring to. Then he, right after he says that, that sounds like he's been redeemed, right? Yeah. I prayed to the cross, I kissed the girls, I crossed the Rubicon. And then he says, he sings, what are these dark days I see in this world so badly bent? I cannot redeem the time, the time so idly spent. How much longer can it last? How long can it go on? I embrace my love, put down my hair, and cross the Rubicon. So it it feels to me as though the darkness really uh, overshadows the possibility of any real salvation, and that these just become stations along the journey that are ultimately shaded in what he now calls in that last stream from July 9th, it's the shadow kingdom. We're living in the shadow kingdom. And so that's a kingdom where redemption isn't possible, but you have to be able to discern and to learn to live within what he calls, what I paraphrase as the, uh, uh, from the 91st Psalm, Besel Shaddai Itlonan, that I dwell within the shadows of Shaddai. And that's the place where he finds comfort. That's the place where he finds the ability to sing about love, but it's nestled in deep darkness. Yeah. And and finally, what's Gnostic about his take on quote unquote end times theology? His take on end times theology, it, it really returns to um, what I was saying here about crossing the Rubicon. You can look, for example, at those three albums and see that when he was studying in the Vineyard Fellowship with the Apocalypticists, and I want to say that one of the guys who was writing his reading of the um, uh, of the end of times theology. I'm trying to think of the name of the evangelical in the 70s who was doing that, who was very popular. I want to say it was Hal Linden, but I feel like that was the actor and not the apocalypticist. Hal, Hal Lindsay? Lindsay, yes, I, that I, was it. Yes. Yeah, Lindsay, yeah. sorry. It was yeah. Hal Lindsay. Lake Great so, Planet Earth. <laughs> that's exactly it. So Lake Great Planet Earth, he was he was devouring Lake Great Planet Earth at Planet Earth. And we actually know in the bootlegs from those shows of the gospel years that he was kind of preaching between songs in an uncontrollable kind of ecstatic fervor yeah. all of this end times theology stuff. And he was doing it in some of the most liberal colleges across North America where they were booing him off the stage and, and hoping that he would just stop. And, and people were infuriated with what he was doing. And that was part of his song and dance man routine that he was going through. Um, but I feel like it was a little bit more refined uh, on slow train coming that, you know, he was saying that it was, it was that train that's coming around the bend, that there is an end of time that's coming. And he is constantly warning about the, uh, about the apocalypse. But as I said now, um, just before there, there is a sense that we're already within the end of times. Now, I think what the deepest dwelling in the place of the deepest darkness as Psalm 91 suggests is that we're already there. And to understand, as the mystics have always understood, that the, the texture of time is constantly folding in on itself. And to, to be deluded into thinking that there is a linearity to time, that there is a beginning and that there is an end, that's a very um, small mind, human mind way of calculating things. But Dylan is going into big mind consciousness quite often. And when he's able to cross the Rubicon, uh, or don the uh, the mantle of the Gnostic and, and decry those who call him a false prophet, he says he doesn't remember when he was born or when he died. So in that sense, um, they're really it's not it's not a relevant term of reference for the kind of song that he's singing on and channeling, and that when we sing along with Dylan, that we're also singing on. And that's what's really interesting is that there there is no beginning and there is no end. Think about the Dylan catalog itself. It seems like it's almost infinite. And when you get immersed in it, you begin to lose all sense uh, of time. So I don't think for him there is an end time. I think he's, he's moved through it. He did do the Hal Lindsey thing, and, and he, he absorbed it, transformed it, donned the mask and discarded it, and realized that ultimately um, it's not dark yet, but it's getting there, which points to the possibility of the apocalypse being always not yet. But I think in these later years, he's really from time out of mind up to rough and rowdy ways, he really is resigned to the reality that um, this is apocalypse now. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, again, you, you kind of already uh, touched on this in numerous ways throughout the conversation, but just to bring it all together, how is Dylan's Gnostic message specifically American, and how is it specifically religious in an American sense? Okay, so the the Gnosticism is American, we said, for a number of reasons, just to recap. One of them is, is the obsession with selfhood and the, and the pioneering spirit um, that really is the basis of the American dream. And whether you're looking at... Um, uh, subterranean homesick blues where he says that the president of the United States the United States must sometimes stand naked right remember that that, that really um, scandalous line that he said uh, in the late 60s I mean that's uh, an abomination if you think about it but ultimately he was prescient in terms of understanding and only a Gnostic could come off with that kind of language um, but he returns to that place um, especially in the epic Murder Most Foul. That's 17 minutes of Americana Gnosticism and the psychopomp who takes us through a good part of that journey actually is Wolfman Jack, right? So when you begin to see the way that he's painting the divine comedy of the American dream, its death and its rebirth, for him, if he plays the role of Dante, um, you know, the, he, 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 uh, he puts Wolfman Jack in the place of Virgil who's taking us through the river Styx as the ferryman and showing us here is the roadkill. Here are all of the moments. And specifically for him, the, the most important moment to mark was the assassination of JFK. He's very, very um, explicit about that in Murder Most Foul, but he's doing this in a, in a kind of mythic way to show here is just another example of the cataclysm, the cataclysmic creative process, right? If the Kennedy wasn't assassinated, God forbid, would Dylan and would the 60s have been as generative as they were in terms of the music of protest, of liberation, of the, of the yearning and the desire for freedom from oppression and from all of the dark clouds that emerged during that period with assassination after assassination? Dylan is saying, this is the, the, the mythic lands, the Americana landscape, is one whereby um, we are constantly being betrayed, our dreams are constantly dashed and destroyed, where we're constantly surrounded by the darkness of death, and the genius of being part of the Americana landscape, of which he is probably one of the greatest exemplars, uh, that's the reason why I think he was awarded the Nobel Prize, justly so, even though in my book I share a letter of correspondence with my late great good friend and mentor Harold Bloom, who also saw himself as a Gnostic of the highest order. And when I asked him for his advice about writing uh, about Bob Dylan as the great Gnostic Americana poet par excellence, you'll see what the response is in the book that Harold Bloom gave to me. He had a different opinion. But I would suggest he is uh, a, an Americana Gnostic of the highest order because he understands how to look at the landscape, to look at the roadkill, and to create the soundtrack of our broken dreams and also allow us in the process of looking and contemplating that brokenness to be creative and transforming that suffering into the sweetest song. And that is the salve that we are given in lieu of salvation or redemption. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I guess too, the, uh, uh, the, you know, his, his recreation, his, his Gnostic smashing and put together of the American songbook. Uh, and you know, yeah, like his, the way that he embodies archetypes, like it, it's, it, it, I did realize, you know, years ago who Dylan was as the American song and dance man. And actually something you said really made that, that archetype more apparent to me when you talked about him preaching on the bootlegs, right? Yep. That's an American song and dance man, right? The traveling preacher, possibly exactly. with a guitar, right? That's he, right, that's right. Yeah. And a, and a chorse, you know, like the, the, I, it, when people didn't understand when he put out his Christmas album, when you, I mean, if you think about the American songbook or songs, music that people listen to that is pre-1949, pre-1955, that's going to be it now, right? That's right. going to and, be. And, and what's the ultimate irony? I mean, you, I, I agree 110% with what you're saying, but the Christmas album is always a, a thorn in the side of, the Jewish listeners who said, like, I, I abandoned you once when you betrayed me, Bob, when you did the gospel music. Now you go and do a Christmas album. But what's the joke? The joke is on both those on both sides, because all those Christmas songs, which were so ubiquitous in terms of the Americana song, who are they written by? 99% of them are written by Jews. Yeah. Right. So he is completely true 
to this process of what one of my teachers called, David Rossi is called creative betrayal. He has to continually be in this act of betrayal. I think that's a Gnostic pose, yeah. right? To be able to betray in order to be able to liberate, to be a jokester in order to be able to provoke and to arouse those uh, slumbering sparks into flight uh, and freedom from the darkness. So I, um, I would totally concur with what you're saying. What he was doing is completely in line with the the uh, American song and dance man and preacher, that's what you would expect if you pulled up to a tent at the circus or at a, you know at a, a, a traveling church. Yeah. Um, so uh, I talked about some of the archetypes that he embodies, particularly you know we already talked about his his protean shape shifting trickster. But uh, you wrote in in one of your pieces, did Dylan believe his messianic search had evolved from personhood to process to then dissolve the differences between Judaism? Christianity and Islam. Now, I might just be riffing, or you, you actually got a dopamine hit from making connections. So, so maybe I'm just getting high in my own supply here. But reading those lines, I can't think of two or three other Jewish figures who are something of tricksters uh, with similar goals and whose Kabbalistic thought had some Gnostic elements. And please excuse my Anglicization of their names, but uh, Shabbatai Zevi, Jacob Frank, and Anna Frank. Mm -hmm. Is there something to this comparison, or am I just completely? off here no i you, you're not getting high off your own supply it's definitely it there's a deep truth here and i actually spent some time talking about it uh, up here at this uh, skull and residence that i just completed on fire island uh, in conversation with my friend and teacher show magid who um reminded me as i as i quoted bobby zimmerman's hebrew name it's exactly what you're saying his hebrew name is very obscure and it is shabtai the mm -hmm. first name of shabtai tzvi zissel that's his hebrew name now, whether his parents were conscious or not when they named him that, um, the Saturnian impulse that is embedded within the name Shabtai Tzvi, um, his heretical impulse, his dissolution of boundaries, uh, his antinomian or hypernomian um, kind of critique and, and, uh, and transmorgification of, uh, of, uh, of Judaism and Islam, and, and then furtherance by uh, Jacob and, and Anna Frank, are very much in line with... Uh, the the gnostic process that um that dylan is uh, is 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 channeling the only difference is is that from my knowledge there's not uh as much music in the world of the frankists there is liturgy um and there is some choreography i don't know how much music there is in the world of frankism that's just my ignorance but i know in the world of shabtai tzvi i've done a lot of research into sabbatianism and specifically um, the uh, the Moranos and the Donme in Turkey, yeah. who um, have gone to great lengths to preserve um, and also to create much of their song and liturgy based on the teachings and the uh, the provocateur, jokester reality and shape-shifting that Shabtai Tzvi enacted during his lifetime. So we have a lot of music and liturgy that's been uh, preserved and still exists within the Donme uh, of this, uh, this 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 Turkish sect that that came out of Shabtai Tzvi's lineage. So yes, yes, and yes. I, I I think that there's a lot that is there, and it's really unavoidable when you go the name. You have to remember that there's something about the name within um, within all religions, but especially within Judaism. Uh, the sages teach us Hashemot Nishtanot Lefi Hashlichut, which means it's a great shape shifting uh, adage to conclude with. That is to say that our names are constantly changing and shifting according to the mission we're deployed upon. And so if you think about it, um, you could probably give a name or an inflection of a name to every one of Dylan's albums based on where he was in that process of, um, of, of channeling the Gnostic process of transformation, of self-transformation. And whether he was, he says it in Slow Train Coming, you can call me Bobby, you can call me Zimmy. Um, you know, he goes through a whole list of names. He never says you can call me Shabtai, but those who know his, his secret Jewish identity know that that's really his true name. And that's the name of Shabtai Tzvi, for sure. Yeah.
Yeah, amazing. And and for those who don't know what we're talking about, uh, we do have an upcoming series coming up on these these three fascinating figures. I'll I'll link it uh, once it's out uh, below. Uh, okay, so unfortunately, uh, I could go all night. I could always go all night, but especially of this. And as you said, uh, Dylan's oeuvre is endless. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know if we, if, if we should just wrap up. Or I, I, I did put a question on here, which is, can you take us through a few Dylan songs, share some lyrics that, that illustrate his Gnostic impulses, but uh, you've already kind of done that, but it is, do, you, do you have some more samples or <laughs> have I, I mean, taken I, up enough of your time? No, I mean, I could go on endlessly into the night with you as well, but I, I would just suggest to readers <laughs> that um, I strongly encourage you to, uh, to check out the book, God Knows Everything is Broken. Uh, every chapter uh, has an index of songs there so that if you're interested in a specific song, outside of the 17 chapters that I go through, each one of them is dedicated to one song, but then in true Dylan fashion, which in many ways is like Lurianic Kabbalah, you can't understand the text of Dylan unless you understand all the texts of Dylan. You can't understand the Kabbalah of Luria unless you understand all of it. And that's really the sign of a great mystical master is that everything is intertwined and you can get everything from one song, but one song leads you to everything else within his oeuvre. So, I want to kind of um, whet people's appetite and encourage them to check out um, the book to find uh, a place that uh, that interests them, whether it's through I and I, whether it's through um, the the really wonderful movie I'm Not There that was done, um, and um, and uh, the uh, the I minus I, uh, love minus uh, love minus zero, in the garden, love sick forever young, desolation row. Uh, long Time Gone, All Along the Watchtower. These are just some of the songs that um, I go through in great depth and constantly do that with a, a Gnostic analysis in mind. But I'll just leave you reiterating again to me, you know, to encapsulate why Dylan is the Gnostic Americana bard par excellence and not a false prophet as he was accused so often, especially in the 1966 famous outtake uh, in Albert's Hall, remember, when they screamed at him, Judas, right? Judas which is in a sense calling him the Jew, the betrayer and the false prophet on a certain level. Yeah. What is his response? Se you know, decades later in false prophet, I know what I know. And that to me is the sign of the ultimate jokester trickster who is the Gnostic Americana um, bard par excellence, Bob Dylan. So check out the, that work as well as other amazing and interesting works. There's a, a work on Leonard Cohen called Tangle of Matter and Ghosts, which has its own Gnostic resonances. Hopefully we'll have a chance down the road um, to uh, discuss that together. But check out all the works uh, of contemporary modern Jewish mysticism and Gnosticism on panui.org. And uh, the Deacon John, deepest blessings uh, of darkness and luminal darkness towards the ultimate liberation of the here and now. And I'm just grateful for this incredibly engaging conversation. And to all of your listeners and viewers, um, may you be blessed with uh, the luminal darkness that leads to uh, redemptive living. Rabbi, thank you so much. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Goodbye. Take care.